Hey guys, welcome to uh, welcome to Fork 2020 for the pre-recorded talk for the paper recovering from biased data and fairness constraints in proof accuracy. Uh, obviously, yeah, COVID, so Fork is online. And uh, thanks for coming. This I'm Kevin Stangle, and this paper is joint with my advisor Adam Blum, and we're from TTIC. So let's get into it. Okay, so if you have a very short attention span, like me, uh, this whole talk exists in this slide. And the takeaway from the talk up front is that if the train, oh, sorry. this is a paper in fairness and machine learning. So if the takeaway from the talk is if we make some assumptions on how the training data distribution is biased, and so the training data that we use to learn our classifier doesn't capture reality, some fairness constraints actually improve accuracy. So we are going to work through that and define some things, but that is the overall message of the talk. And also just while I have you here, the live talk is on June 1st, 2020. We are session two, we're the very last talk. And uh, that's 2.20 p.m. Uh, Central Eastern Standard Time, so the Eastern American Seaboard time. And also, this is a theoretical paper. These are all theoretical claims, so uh, don't overinterpret anything you see. All right, so this is the roadmap of the talk. I'm going to talk a little bit more about motivation. We're going to talk about the label model, so how the true labels are generated, uh, how, how bias enters the data set, bias models. We're going to talk about some fairness constraints. And then we're going to talk about how those fairness constraints interact with the bias models. And I'm going to sketch our main theorem. And I would encourage you to read our paper on archive or the conference version. They're basically equivalent. Um, and so let's continue. So here's a slide that if you do fairness and machine learning, you probably are really sick of seeing. But uh, it is important. So to talk a little bit about the history of this research area. So this is the title slide from a ProPublica article called Machine Bias that uh, claimed there was substantial demographic disparities uh, of COMPASS, which is an actuarial risk assessment tool used to decide um, some criminal sanctions, like whether or not you should be released on bail, and it, it assesses your risk. And this article received a very large amount of attention and it initiated some research in the academic machine learning community. Um, the claims in the ProPublica article are uh, hotly debated and their interpretations. So ongoing research area. And one of the responses to ProPublica was to say, okay, we want to do machine learning. We're doing machine learning. Uh, when we train our models, like, again, basically we're doing optimization, we have an objective function, maybe um, some surrogate loss, and let's add some constraints to the optimization problem that ensure some kind of balance across demographic groups. So we are not allowed to do the disparities that um, are of concern. So these fairness constraints they're supposed to capture some part of maybe justice or fairness or, or equity um, as a constraint that can be put into your optimization problem. And that is not really the tack we take in this paper. We take a different perspective where we are saying, okay, let's make some assumptions on on how the labels are actually generated from the data. And let's make an assumption that there exists like a very nice ground truth reality, which is sort of very fair, but the bias comes into the data set from the fact that we are not given data from that nice distribution. We're given data that's mediated maybe by social forces. Maybe some um, parts of input space, are, they just don't show up in our data set for maybe social reasons or some kind of measurement error. Or maybe we have human labelers who are not giving us reliable labels on some demographic groups. And this could skew our learning process. And given that, the question is, do these fairness constraints that people have thought of 
for um, kind of that other sort of motivation? Will those fairness constraints help us in our learning process? Can we learn, can, will they help us learn an accurate model that is sort of fair and accurate on the true data distribution, the one we don't have access to? Uh, that is our high level motivation. And there's a um, substantial philosophical overlap between our paper and a great paper by uh, Friedler et al. in 2018. So I recommend looking at that paper. Okay, so, oh, sorry, I went backwards. Let's go forwards. Um, this kind of hashes out the last slide a little bit more. Again, normally adding constraints to an optimization problem strictly hurts your objective, right? Because uh, the space of feasible uh, solutions is smaller. But when we do plain ERM on the bias data, we're optimizing for the wrong thing. And we want to characterize when these fairness constraints have desirable behavior that helps us recover accurate classifiers on the true data distribution. So maybe these fairness constraints can align uh, our learning process with sort of the true objective. And this is motivated by a great paper by uh, John Kleinberg and Manesh Raghavan that uh, focuses on a very similar problem, but in a ranking setting uh, for the Rooney rule. All right, let's continue on. So now we're gonna get into some of the sort of nitty gritty of our model. So just assume you have an input space X, kind of real vectors, pretty much the standard thing. We have two demographic groups in the population. Assume now for their, their disjoint, that just sort of makes things nicer. Uh, and there's a data distribution D, which is actually sort of a pair of data distribution. So you can think of it as like we flip a coin that decides whether or not a sample is in group A or group B. And then once uh, that choice has happened, DA and DB determine how the features are distributed in group A and group B respectively. Also, um, group A here, you should think of R as less than a half. So group A is the majority group. I think you can see my mouse. Group B is sort of the minority group slash disadvantaged group. So group B is the one that the bias models harm. And group A is uh, sort of the majority group. And also a note on kind of, uh, I guess the sort of philosophical perspective about where, about the goals of this learning process is, you should think we're an actor who wants to make accurate decisions. That is our primary motivation. And we are sort of showing how maybe fairness and accuracy in this, in this context are sort of aligned. All right, so we are making some assumptions on the labeling process on how true, true labels Y are generated uh, given a, a uh, sample point X or an example, a data point X, sorry. So assume we have two Bayes optimal classifiers, H A star and H B star coming from some hypothesis class. And we're in binary classification here, it's just super, supervised machine learning. And when we're generating, when we're uh, generating samples, labeled pairs, this is the true data distribution. So draw X according to DA or DB. So first you do the coin flip and get to the group, and then you draw X from the corresponding distribution. And if X is an A, then the Bayes optimal classifier just corresponds to group A, H A, uh, H -A star. And similar for B, if X is in B. And so when we, you see the sentence X and B, you should think either that there's, a, fee, that there's a, a coordinate of X that denotes group membership, or alternatively that the feature space is like very rich and uh, eight, and then the model class can like implicitly separate the groups. So we're going to allow our, our algorithms to return two classifiers, one for each demographic group. Um, okay, so once, once we have decided what group we're in, then we evaluate H, H star, or H A star, H A B star. And then with some probability eta, so eta is a uh, parameter here of the label process. Uh, with one minus eta, the prediction of H star is actually the tree label. And with probability eta, it's flipped. So this is very similar to the random classification noise model from Anglin and Laird, but there's an interpretative difference where these Y are the true labels and they're not the consequence of a noisy labeling process. There's like limits to our predictability. Um, 
and so the Ys are the true labels. But, and um, just putting this in some more general uh, learning theory context, this is like uh, the random classification noise model is intermediate between realizable and agnostic in terms of learning difficulty. All right, so this is just kind of foot stomping part of the last slide where we want to note that eta, the noise rate for the label process, not noise rate, sorry. You can think of those. Anyway, is the same in both groups. And also we assume that P, which is the fraction of the input space that gets the positive label according to the Bayes optimal predictor, is the same across both groups. Those two criteria together basically suffice to show that uh, we satisfy most fairness definitions on the true data distribution. All right, and in general, H A star is not equal to H B. This is uh, this is sort of just the background. Again, if H A star equals H B star, you could even the wing can just ignore bias data because we just learn on data from group A. We could discard everything from group B, so bias concerns go away immediately. And again, our learning algorithm returns separate classifiers, so we want to learn each one of these. Okay, so I haven't really talked too much about bias yet. This is sort of to kind of warm you up for stuff that comes next, which is in our setting, there's two main, there's two failure modes for learning a fairness constrained classifier or a fairness aware classifier um, using these fairness constraints. The first is the Bayes optimal hypothesis, HA star, HA B star, uh, may not satisfy the fairness constraint on the biased data. And so it's, it won't really, it won't be in the set of acceptable solutions. It won't be returned by your algorithm. But then second, within that uh, set of hypotheses satisfying the fairness constraint, maybe another hypothesis that is not H star has lower error than H star on the biased data. And our main result, which is still coming, characterizes a sufficient condition for when, and necessary actually, for when H star is the lowest biased error classifier that satisfies equal opportunity on the biased data. All right. And also, just to clarify here, um, yeah, so biased error and evaluating the fairness constraint on the biased data. But that means you're getting the best classifier on the true data. Okay. So here are some bias. Here, this is a summary of the bias models we're going to talk about. The first um, one is underrepresentation bias. So we have basically two bias models, and then the third is the combination of the two. Okay, so this bias model basically says, do the labeling process from the past slides. And if you are in group B, and your label Y is one, you, might, you just won't appear in the training data with some probability. So for instance, the probability you are discarded from the training set is one minus beta. So we're going to see less positives throughout input space from group B. And we're going to explain in a second why that could trick plain ERM. So just pause. Here, oh, here it is, actually. So here's what the data looks like after the underrepresentation bias process. The left side is the uncorrupted data, and the right side is the data with much less positives. And note that this beta positive parameter is uniform across the input space, so you can see there's less positives below the hyperplane and there's less positives above. And also, um, note in the, and if you look at this, actually there is now less negative examples throughout the entire region of the input space. So plain ARM will just classify all of group B as negative. Again, our noise model has this nice uniformity in input space once you know H, A star and H, B star. And also in the most general bias model for underrepresentation, we also allow underrepresentation of negatives. All right, the next bias model, labeling bias. You should think of the resume experiment from Bertrand and Molinython, where the noisy where the labeler or, or it's sort of the labeling process from HB star, it like when you're in group B and you're actually a a, a positive, there's some probability you just get flipped to negative. You still show up in the data, but now you're incorrectly in negative. And this is only, this is one-sided. This is only happening from negative to positive. So again, we're going to get an enrichment of negatives across input space that could trick just plain around. All right, so here are some fairness constraints. I'm going to go through this slide pretty quick. The big one you want to remember here is equal opportunity. That is sort of the best uh, intervention in our set of models. 
So that requires that the true positive rate in group B is the same as the true positive rate in group A, equalized odds uh, has that requirement, and then it also requires that the false positive rates are equal across both groups. We also talked briefly about demographic parity, which says, give me, if it assumes a positive outcome is sort of more preferable from the perspective of people being classified, and it says, I want the same fraction of positives in both groups. And then the last one we consider is data reweighting. So that says, I want you to match the observed fraction of positives in the training data of group B to the fraction of positives in group A. So like reweight group B to have the same um, percentage of, of positives as in group A. Also, just to clarify, like pretty much throughout uh, sort of the motivation of these constraints and our bias models, like the positive outcome is sort of more preferred. Like maybe that's giving you like something nice, like a loan. Um, all right. So again, we're here's underrepresentation bias, and now we're going to sort of talk about how these, how the fairness constraints interact with different bias models. And equal opportunity behaves well in the underrepresentation bias model. It behaves great, and the reason that is is equal opportunity requires the same fraction of positive examples from both groups are labeled as positive. So if we look at the data and the data is sufficiently biased that plain ERM wants to say, also when I say ERM, I just mean the classifier that has the lowest zero one lost on the training data. And if that's a, if that, if plain ERM wants to say uh, negative or no on all of group B, if it does that, it's going to have to do the exact same with group A, but that's going to induce a lot of training error on group A, so it would not be um, the right choice from ERM, uh, right short, so not be the right trade-off as long as uh, this requirement holds. Okay, so let's continue. Do, do. All right, now we're gonna talk a little about, uh, oh yeah, so demographic parity doesn't work in underrepresentation bias, which is kind of funny because the true data distribution does satisfy demographic parity, but then demographic parity doesn't fix the bias. And the reason is very simple. It's because the Bayes optimal classifier doesn't satisfy demographic parity. So it's the first failure mode of those two failure modes we talked about. And um, this is why it's because uh, we, we have this uh, inequality here. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about labeling bias. Labeling bias makes equalized odds fail and the intuition, also, we're basically, I'm, I'm going through some counterexamples for why some fairness constraints fail in some bias models. And one of the things that is sort of like the key takeaway here is that if eta is equal to zero and a fairness constraint can't recover in that model, that's like deeply inadequate because eta equals zero is the easiest case for learning because you have total, uh, everything's disjoint between uh, the positive and negative parts of space once you've found H uh, star. Okay, so going back to this. So assume eta is equal to zero, but nu. So nu is the flip parameter and labeling bias, that's not zero. And then the Bayes optimal classifier for HA is false positive rate zero, true positive rate one. But the only way for um, H B star to classify all the negative individuals in its own positive region as negative is for the classifier to uh, move upwards and classify less positives to get those negatives up there. But the second you do that, you're violating the true positive rate. So equalized odds, then you can't use HA because there's no way for HA star, because there's no way for HB star to match HA star. And so those guys, they're, they're not recovered. And again, just our whole goal is to recover H star here. All right. So the other intervention that I want you to think about is the reweighting intervention where you just make the data set have the same fraction of positives for group A, group B. And again, so group B matches group A. And that worked in the past two bias models, but it doesn't work when we combine labeling bias and underrepresentation bias. And I, I'm gonna go through this sort of quick, but basically because we have beta neg and beta pause, we can kind of move the mass around such that uh, we have this we have the same overall statistics in terms of positive and negatives but where those positive and negatives are has moved and then now ERM is indifferent between 
H star and just sending all of it group B as negative. And we can twiddle that so it prefers sending everything from group B to negative. All right, so the summary of this part of the talk is that equal opportunity has nice behaviors across our bias models. Why? You know, these bias models, uh, they don't really change how positive samples from group B are distributed with respect to HB star. They're sort of including more negatives and there's less positive sample, uh, uh, there's less positive samples, so they maybe get washed out by negatives. But the fact that there's more of them above HB star and less of them below is unchanged. When I say less and above, I'm basically always sort of thinking of HA, HB star as, um, or I guess H just H star as a hyperplane. All right, so here's our main theorem. I'm, I'm just gonna read this to you now. Assume labels are generated by P, D, R, H star, eta. So that's the labeling process from above, corrupted by both underrepresentation under bias and labeling bias with parameters beta pause, beta neg, nu, and assume these two inequalities. Then H star is the lowest bias classifier, satisfying equal opportunity in the bias training distribution, and H star is recovered by equal opportunity constrained ERM. So, okay, Kevin, you just showed me some inequalities. Like, what do these mean? Um, there we go. So to give you a feel for the theorem, uh, if R is less than a third, then the bounds are satisfied for all eta less than a fourth, regardless of what beta pos, beta neg, and nu are, as long as they're not factorized. So that's kind of fun. But um, just looking at line one, this line makes sure that say, that saying all positive is less accurate than H star. And the second line shows that all negative is worse than H star in terms of accuracy. And um, you can sort of see that. So this is like one minus eta minus eta. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of running out of time, but I guess I'm still under time. To, to give you a, a, a um, some more intuition for the theorem. Because of sort of the linearities of uh, the label model, the only things you really need to ensure are that H star has lower error than the all negative uh, classifier and the all positive classifier. And that last inequality, um, those, last, those pairs of inequalities make that hold. So there's really only three classifiers we need to be worried about. And again, that, that just shows that H star is has the lowest um, biased error. But we still have to sort of find that, uh, that classifier. That's obviously a complexity of learning and it's hard to do. We're not actually focused on efficiently implementing that. We're just saying that if you could efficiently solve the ERM problem for a uh, equal opportunity constrained ERM, it would give you uh, the best thing in this label model. And uh, those constraints are necessary and sufficient. So now I'm gonna sort of summarize the talk what we have shown is, I think kind of fun, is that if we make some bias uh, assumptions on the bias process, fairness and accuracy are not in tension, and these fairness constraints help us recover from biased data. So that's great. And there's some separations between fairness notions depending on the bias model, and equal opportunity works well in our bias models. And I think this motivates a more general point, which is that explicitly modeling sources of bias, you know, it could be useful because then you can create interventions that are both more fair and more accurate, and have your cake and eat it too. And also sort of this problem of recovering from biased data is, and having the data not measure what you actually want it to measure, I think can be, is quite insidious. And I think there's some good questions uh, there. All right, so thanks so much for listening. And thanks everyone for everyone from Fork for organizing Fork despite the crazy times of COVID. I hope you guys are all safe and doing well. I hope you've enjoyed looking at the walls of my apartment. And I, I hope to meet some of you guys during the, during the conference or in the next few days. I will, I will be there. I'm really excited. There's so many good papers at Fork that I, I like, papers that I've seen a little bit. And oh man, that's great. And, uh, thanks, and thanks to John Kleinberg and Manash Raghavan for some comments on a draft version. And um, thanks to Avram for all his help. Avram is amazing. Um, yeah, I hope to see you guys at the session. Oh, and here's an archive link. I guess, um, yeah, I guess that's everything for me. All right. Thanks, guys. Let's see if I can stop this recording. All right, here we go.